welcome everyone. We are so delighted to have Dr. Deanna Minnick join us once again for a riveting conversation about food and mood. So important. For those of you who have gotten a physical experience box or downloaded the virtual box, you'll have wanted to pull out the food and mood tracker that Dr. Minnick has shared with us. I hope you've had a chance to actually fill it out. I think it'll be really interesting uh, to look at that in addition to understanding what she has to present today. So Dr. Minnick, take it away. All right, thank you, Robin. It's really great to be here with everybody. I feel like this is a very timely topic these days, especially with the pandemic and what we've been enduring for months on end with really no clear end in sight. And so I, I've been thinking about the different types of people and our personalized responses to the pandemic as it relates to our mental health. And what I've come to is that I, I think that there are basically five types of responses as it relates to our food and mood. One is that for some people, maybe they haven't made any changes during this time, that they've stayed steady with their routine. They haven't had a huge upset from the pandemic. I then think that there are uh, other people who were already eating really healthy and they got better in terms of their, their eating habits and they felt better and they were able to execute on these lifestyle habits. I think that there's probably another segment of people who were already eating healthy and then they started to slip because emotional eating got in the way, uh, accessibility to the grocery stores wasn't uh, quite the same. And then I think that there's this segment of people who were not eating healthy, who might have been depressed or anxious, and they could have gone in two directions as well, either using the pandemic as an opportunity to create change in their lives, which I know some of them have, or to continue that slippery decline into more stress eating, uh, more depression, more anxiety. So wherever you are on this spectrum, and I think people are truly all over the map on this, I don't see that people are emerging in one way as a result of this pandemic. And what's really interesting is that I just recently surveyed my online group and I, I can truly see that everybody has a very different response to what's happening. So what I'd like to do is uh, I'm a scientist first and foremost. And I'd like to focus on what we know about the science. We're learning a lot about COVID-19, the different trends. And what's really unique about this time is that we're experiencing this at a collective level. This is not just one part of the country. It's not just one continent. We are all having this experience. And I do think that long after the pandemic has passed, we are going to see some lasting repercussions on mental health, emotional health, and stress. And so we need to be taking good care of ourselves in that direction. So I'll present to you a, a personal approach as well as a more professional approach looking at the science as well as the clinical implementation. If you are a clinician and if you're not, that's okay. You can think about these different strategies I provide and perhaps talk with your own healthcare practitioner about how you might be able to implement them. These are my disclaimers and disclosures. So I wanna start with a story. We all have a story. And again, this is the 21st century. We are living in the age of personalized medicine, personalized health, and even personalized nutrition. And so I would encourage you to think about your own story. I, the way that I got into nutrition was in somewhat of an emotional or a mental framework. And so I grew up in the Midwest, I grew up in Chicago, and I had very strict parents who uh, were very conscientious about what we were eating at home, which is kind of unusual for the 1970s when I was growing up, because there really wasn't that same conscientiousness about nutrition, about food as medicine. And so um, for me, it had the, the effect of being a, quite an emotional, and stressful experience to be eating different from my peers. And so that led me into more of a realm of disordered eating. And I do even think about during the pandemic, how people might be reverting to some of their disordered eating habits, right? Whether it's because of lack of support through their community, lack of, uh, you know, just accessibility of food. 
So this is, this is my imprint. This is not everybody's imprint. We all have our own stories. But I do think that me growing up with first a message of health, which some people say, wow, Deanna, that's so desirable that your mom was ahead of the curve. But at the time when other people aren't ahead of the curve, you start thinking, am I on the bleeding edge or the leading edge? And it felt like I was bleeding. I was emotionally having this, this experience. And so I think I do, when, when I am now a professional in this health and nutrition area, I do have some sensitivity to people in the way of their eating, not just from a physical perspective of seeing food as medicine, but food is also a, a connection to something that is deeper. It can be love, it can be connected to memories. And so for us to be thinking about how do we braid together food and mood, that there is such an interconnection here, they're inseparable. And I'm sure that you're seeing that now during the pandemic as you experience more stress, potentially more anxiety and even depression. Sleeping habits are changing. Physical activity habits are changing. And all of this ripples on through to our daily meal. So here's a tool right here. I like tools. Um, and, and one of the ones that we do in functional medicine is we talk about the timeline, a person's timeline. When did things happen? And so if I were to be workshopping this in, uh, in a group, and oftentimes that is my, my preferred method of teaching is I'm in a group setting, I'm having everybody weigh in on their own eating. And so, uh, and I am also adjunct faculty at a university. And, and oftentimes I'll have the students do this activity for themselves where they plot their eating timeline. What are the salient eating events throughout your life? And just to keep it to 10, what are the top 10 that really define your eating in this present day? I think that we don't have to rehash the past to the point of connecting to it with a sense of emotion or regret or blame or guilt. There is a sense of how can we heal what we've come from and at least understand how we're eating now might be reflective of what was happening in, in the past. So I, I shared with you a little bit about my story, and here I am talking with you about nutrition. I never thought I would be doing that growing up as I did. So what we see with doing these types of life story interviews and, and looking at food and mood events is that uh, when we do this, we can see that there are certain patterns that might emerge. And so there, this is a a publication looking at the exploration of the food domain across the life course. And so doing this type of activity can elucidate some specific memories, especially about dinner time. For some reason, dinner is one of those charged moments. And depending on where you're from in the country, you might call it supper, dinner. You know, it's like that, that family meal where parental attitudes, where the, the family has come together. And it's really interesting because some people have commented that during the pandemic, they're actually doing more home cooking and that feels really good to them. And other people are saying, no, I'm a busy mom. I have no time to be cooking at home. I've got a homeschool, I've got to work and I have to find a way to, to be myself and my, my kids. So um, I think uh, this whole idea of returning to home cooking and baking, uh, if you notice what I think happened initially, especially with the pandemic is that we had a lot of momentum around baking. And when I think of baking, I think of comfort foods, the food mood aspect around feeling good. And there's something about the memories that we impart to certain foods and how they generate certain moods just by way of what they carry as a memory. And I'm sure that we all have some food that has some significance beyond its taste. So the way that I approach nutrition is perhaps a little bit unique. Uh, I do think that there are many layers to eating as you're probably already hearing through, through these different things that I'm saying. It's physical, of course, it's energy. It's also social and many of us are missing that component. Now, the literature is a little bit mixed on the social aspects of eating. If we have a tribe that is connected to healthy eating, we tend to eat more like that tribe. And if we are not eating with uh, a tribe that sees health as a major part of their lives, then we might succumb to community eating in such a way that it is um, 
not as healthy and not where we want to be. So this is why I also like to teach in groups and why groups are so important because the group heals the group. And oftentimes we start to take on the, the layer of the group, uh, that imprint. Eating is emotional, it's mental, it's spiritual. It, it's spiritual in the way that it connects us to all of life. So one plate of food, if we think about where everything came from, what it took to grow that, the amount of nature and effort and people that was involved in that one meal can be really a, a very beautiful recognition of acknowledging connection. So what I like to do is to look at the left brain, more of the logical, as well as the right brain approach to food and eating, to realize that our connection with food is more than just the body. It's how we think about food. It's how we think about our bodies. It's how we think about our health. These two are very interconnected. And in fact, you probably have heard of mind-body medicine. Mind-body medicine, I mean, this has been a term that's been out there since the 1980s. And how do we receive that? If you look at the placebo effect. So why is it that we deem the placebo-controlled double blind trial as one of the pinnacles and the hallmarks of the, 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 the highest level of scientific evidence. When we have the placebo built in, we can accommodate for our beliefs, our perceptions, and the actual reality that we create through our mental sphere. So my clinical observation is that how we eat is how we live, and how we live is how we eat. So um, some people <laughs> have commented that it's intimidating to go out to dinner with me because I might be assessing what they're eating and that would be saying something about their life. Uh, I don't do that in the conscious framework unless somebody is asking me, well, what do you think about my eating? Um, but I do think that a plate of food and not just what we are eating, but how we are eating, the speed at which we're taking things in, the experience of it, is it ritualized to eating in a certain place with certain reverence, or do we rush? I, I, I think that for people who are living fast lives, typically they're having fast food. So I'd like you to think about that for yourself. How does your relationship to food say something about your relationship to your life? And so when we think about making a change, either we can change our food to ripple on through to our life, or we can change our life in some small way, whether it's a sleeping habit, physical activity, community habit, relaxation practice, and that will then change our food and our food choices. So there's a bi-directional flow there between food and life. It's part of life. It punctuates our day. It's been estimated that we make something on the order of 200 decisions about food and eating in a day. So there's no surprise that it connects into who we are as people and how we live our lives. And if you look at how we are living, and this is even pre-pandemic, we were already on the slippery slope. Lots of fast eating, and it's not even just localized to the United States. Wherever I travel or have been traveling, I, I see it happening there as well. It's all over the planet. Gigantic portion sizes, fast food meals, people don't have the time. And what's, what is, can be a little bit of an opportunity of the pandemic is that for some people, now they have the time. The time that they were craving and wanting in order to engage in self-care can be available to some people, not to everybody. And there can be a, a variety of reasons as to why that is. But for some people, this may be a good time to investigate and get the kitchen ready, to start to turn over those spices, to really engage with cooking at a deeper level. So this has been going on for some time and, and perhaps this is a, a global wake up call to some huge transformative, transformative change. So the foods we eat influence how we feel. And this happens within hours. This doesn't have to wait a lifetime where you eat a certain way for 10 years and then all of a sudden you feel some other way for the next 10 years. This happens on a daily basis. This happens acutely, this happens within hours. And I'm sure you've had the experience of maybe you've had something really sweet and for that initial 
hour or two, you feel kind of that energy high. You feel like, wow, I've got a lot of energy. But then you start to feel the slump. Or even think of you if you have a cup of coffee, how powerful one eight ounce beverage can make you feel and think. And so much of what you feel and think after eating or drinking something will then prime your behavior for hours on end. So this is where the food and mood interface is, is we see it on a daily basis in our lives. We all have a personal experience about this. The science would suggest that there's truly a connection between nutrition and mental health. And fortunately, the field of nutritional psychiatry has been um, bringing this to light for decades upon decades. In fact, some of the early work in nutritional medicine actually came from psychiatrists who were looking at the role of certain nutrients in pathways that relate to mood through neurotransmitters. If we think of neurotransmitters like dopamine involved in reward, serotonin involved in happiness and contentment, many of the ways that we get to those neurotransmitters in the body involve nutrition. So if we don't have the basis, the precursors of what creates those neurotransmitters, then we're not in proper balance from a brain mental health perspective. This article published in the Lancet Psychiatry Journal, this was in 2015, essentially had the, the large statement that healthy, unprocessed whole food diets consisting largely of plant-based foods like fruits and vegetables led to a good mood. Unhealthy diets would impart more of a depressed mood. And I'm gonna get into what is an unhealthy diet. And I'm not a huge fan of the D word, by the way, so when I think of diet, I think of what Dr. Brian Wansink says about, you know, diet is like die with a T on the end. It's a very, it's kind of a 20th century term. It's old, it's archaic. We need to overturn that. And so one of the ways that we can look at, at food is it's, it's a way of life, right? The, the meaning of diet is really a way of life in Latin. So I would say, uh, and, and also um, Dean Ornish, medical doctor who, who uh, has done a lot with low-fat diets and cardiology talks about that when we think of a diet, typically it means that we're going on it and going off of it. There's a certain type of imprint or relationship that we might have to a diet. So what I'm referring to here now in the 21st century of personalized genomics, looking at lifestyle medicine is not a diet per se. There's definitely room for therapeutic diets but what this article was truly referring to was more of an eating pattern. This is a way of life and how people live. So as I mentioned, how we eat is how we live, how we live is how we eat. And so if we're living fast, we're eating fast. Fast food and eating commercially baked goods, things like pastries and breads and all kinds of uh, things that I would say are brown, yellow, and white at the store wrapped in plastic seem to be correlated with a greater risk of depression. I don't think that many people realize that. And, and even seeing this during the time of, uh, of the pandemic, I go to the grocery store and during the first month, I was seeing people filling up their carts with lots of frozen foods, lots of canned foods, lots of immediate gratification types of foods. And I really just wanted to, to help these people, to let them know that, gosh, if we could make better choices at the level of the point of purchase, we can be priming our brains for better behaviors and better health and not just better health, but more happiness. And I think that most people move in the, in the direction of more pleasure and less pain, more happiness, less unhappiness. And so health is a way to get there. Now, conversely, when we look at the most well-studied diet on the planet, it's the Mediterranean diet. And it's not that I advocate the Mediterranean way of eating for everybody, but it has a couple of great nuggets in that it is full of whole unprocessed foods in very balanced proportions, right? Nothing is too high in fat or too high in carbohydrate. It's very balanced, it's very colorful. So in this study, which was quite large, over 10,000 university graduates, what they found was that the greater the adherence to the Mediterranean diet, the less incidence these people had 
of depression. And there were some significant relationships for things like fruit and nuts, and also looking at the different types of fatty acids in the diet. So I, I do think that eating more whole foods, you know, people often ask me about like, what's the next supplement? Give me the magic bullet. What can I take to override a bad diet? And I just don't think we, you know, th this is the kind of thinking that gets us into a siloed approach, right? It's really about the complex array of a wider palette or a wider pattern. So here, remember how I was mentioning that I would get back to what is an unhealthy dietary pattern. An unhealthy dietary pattern, I often relate to people as being connected to color. So when we don't, do not see color in the diet, things look brown and grilled and fried, or it's yellow like the cakes and breads and pastas, or it's white like white sugar, white salt, like flour, this to me signals that it's devoid of color, it's devoid of life, it's devoid of nature. And this translates into accelerated aging and more inflammation. And one of the things that stresses our mood, stresses our immune system, is more inflammation. And you probably have heard how inflammation is the bedrock of many diseases right now. If you are, are tuned into the naming convention of disease, we see that there, typically there's an itis at the end colitis, diverticulitis, tonsillitis, periodontitis. That itis denotes that there's inflammation. Inflammation is rubor, color, dolor, redness, pain, heat, swelling, two more. So even uh, cancer um, is connected into an inflammatory process. So what is inflammatory in the diet? As I just mentioned, just going with the colors right there will tell you and signal you. And it's not to say that there aren't healthy brown foods, there aren't healthy yellow foods, and there are even some healthy white foods like cauliflower and even coconut and garlic. So sure, there are these outliers, but when people are eating lots of processed foods that carry those colors, typically there is more of an inflammatory response. And for some people, they're not going to change their eating. So what I say to them is, how about we change your cooking? Let's not make things so so grilled, so fried, so burnt, and so damaged because that inflammation in the food is now going to cause inflammation in your body. So these are some of the properties that I consider to be part of an anti-inflammatory diet, which essentially is going to help mood and is also going to help the immune system. Everything is interrelated. I think of these top eight foods as being some high signaling foods for inflammation. The biggest one I think about is sugar. And with sugar, it's a, it's a do loop. We, we feel like we want energy, we wanna feel better. So we grab something that's high in sugar because initially we get that burst. We get that energy from a high sugar food. But the downside is that it's like a roller coaster. We then come down. We feel kind of maybe shaky or tired, need to take a nap, don't have energy to do work. So then we go again and get something high sugar. So I call it the sugar roller coaster. And the way to break that cycle and to start feeling good is again, to move away from all of these added sugars, anything granulated, and to stick to whole food sources of sweetness. Things like a ripe banana or dates or applesauce. I can remember when I was growing up back in the day when I, I have a sweet tooth, most people do. And I often like to see it as a metaphor for looking for the sweetness in life. So when we feel like we've worked really hard, we want a reward, the dopamine is, is, is circulating, uh, typically we reach for something that's high sugar. And that could have been part of our upbringing, you know, back to the eating timeline. So if we finished our dinner, maybe we got dessert. Or if we did really well in school, maybe we got some reward that was candy or something in terms of food gratification. The thing is with sugar is that it is a downward spiral. And even if we could get the message out to our close circle of friends and family about the role of sugar in the immune system, in mood, and if we can just break that at some level or recreate our relationship with sugar, um, it just makes such a huge difference is what I have found with other people and even for myself. So it's not that I refrain from sweetness, because inherently we need sweetness for survival.
people. It's important to have healthy blood sugar and to be fueling our cells. We can get that from protein and from fat and also different carbohydrates. So we don't want to be in a, a place of depriving ourselves because we might just want more. <laughs> so we just need to come into better relationship. So speaking of sugar, the way that this translates is looking at glycemic index. So when something is high in glycemic index, this is referring to its ability to spike our blood sugar, which again leads us to the roller coaster. This very large systematic review looked at over 75,000 people. And by the way, I've selected studies here. There are many studies, but I tried to get the heavy amounts of people looking at significant associations. And what they saw in this study was that eating foods with a higher glycemic index, like the, the high sweetness, the high sugar, high starchy foods is associated with a greater risk for depression. Now you might say, well, maybe those people were depressed and so they were choosing high sugar foods. That could very much be the case. But what we do know is that there is a relationship between the two. So one way to heal that is to come into balanced, better eating with a, a more complex array of different nutrients and not high on sugar. So one of the uh, teaching points that I come from is to eat the rainbow. You know, I wanna make eating fun. When I was growing up, eating was not fun. It was a chore. It was like, oh my gosh, so much analysis. My mom is teaching me to read labels of foods at the age of nine. So there was an, a lot of analysis paralysis. And what I would say is that it's so important in our way to find ways to make it fun, to make it an art, because it's something we've got to do every day and we can learn so much about ourselves and even grow personally through that experience of eating. So here's the good news. Here's what I really want you to take away from this presentation, that eating more fruits and vegetables has been associated with less psychological distress and better mood. And I listed a number of studies below, a number of studies. I mean, it's compelling. You know, as a nutritionist um, and being in research for some time, I can arm wrestle on people about soy, about dairy, about meat. I mean, you, you give me a topic, I'll find literature to support either side. And that is what tends to happen. But with fruits and vegetables, the reason why I can rally behind this from a scientific point of view is because there's so much data. There is no arm wrestling, in my view. There is no mental gymnastics that needs to happen. There is copious research and I feel very comfortable as a scientist, as a clinician, as an author to really advocate and get behind fruits and vegetables. Now, does that mean that everybody can eat the same fruits and vegetables? Not necessarily. We need to have a personalized approach. But the fact that nature has provided us with a wide spectrum, if one fruit is not working for us, we can shift to another and get the benefits of that fruit or vegetable or maybe nut or seed or whole grain or cup of tea. You know, I, I want us to think broadly about plants. It's not just fruits and vegetables. It's teas. It's even coffee within some moderation. We have to think of how we take that in. But look at everything that is connected to plants, even spices and herbs. You know, even on my breakfast this morning, my breakfasts look like people's dinners, I think. I, I tend to go heavy on breakfast. I'm a breakfast eater. I'm less of a dinner eater. And so when I make my breakfast, just even this morning, I poured on spices. I love spices. Spices are like a little pharmacy in our kitchen, right? And these very intense substances are concentrated distillates of nature. So even if you can't get to the store to buy fruits and veggies, what do you do? You make sure that your spice cabinet is stocked up. And this is the time to do it during the, the fall and winter months as people go more internal, there isn't as much in the way of fresh fruits, not as much in the way of fresh vegetables. Let's turn to other things like warm teas, soups, sauces, broths, and spices. Really important in my point of view. So what do we see here? With, with more fruit and vegetable servings, we see an upward swing towards better life satisfaction score. This is a very interesting article here. If you just even grab the citation and you want more information, this is a great review article. They looked at all of the benefits of having more fruits and veggies. And as you can see, with greater servings, better life satisfaction. I mean, who doesn't want that? 
I mean, we, we uh, go through so many different hoops through our lives to find more satisfaction, don't we? Whether it's a better job, a better relationship, better friends, better living situation, wherever we live, a better home. So what if we were to just change our mindset by having more fruits and vegetables? Just amazing to see the impact. Now, this is another point that I think is significant. Of all of these different studies on fruits and vegetables and better mood, this is one that I found truly um, kind of jaw-dropping, actually, that well-being and happiness increase with the consumption of fruits and vegetables. So that's, that's really amazing just to digest that information. But if we want to quantify it and say, well, how much? How much of an increase? Well, that increase was equal to the psychological gain of moving from unemployment to employment. Just think of that shift. If you've ever lost a job, the stress that is imparted from that. And then getting a, a job when you've been in that place of having the stress of survival. So eating fruits and vegetables can create that same shift, that same buffer, that same range of change in our lives, which again, I just keep coming back to. If we want to start feeling good and less reactive, less angry, less sad, really looking to our foods, what we're taking in. And here's another one of these studies. I mean, again, there are so many of them. Looking at the food and mood relationship is... Um, you know, we used to look a lot at fruits and vegetables for reducing chronic disease. And now what we're seeing is that there's another element. It's not just health, it's happiness that we're seeing. This is a study with more than 400 adults showing that having more fruits and vegetables was associated with greater flourishing in life. Here's what I really like about this study. They showed that not only was eating fruits and vegetables associated with greater flourishing, what, what is greater flourishing? They defined it as greater well-being, curiosity, and even creativity. I just find that is really fantastic. If more people knew that they could be more creative, and when you're more creative, you're more expansive, you feel more free. And I do a lot of lecturing even on creativity as an essential ingredient in a healthy life. And one of the ways to get more creative is also to get more creative with food. So it kind of works both ways. So I just really like this, this science that I'm seeing, eating fruits and vegetables here, also connecting to emotional well-being. I'm not going to focus too much on all of these different studies. I'm just giving you a bird's eye view into what is out there. In, in this particular study, what they saw was that in order to see meaningful changes for young adults, there needed to be approximately seven to eight servings of fruits or vegetables to have that positive affect. So keep in mind with young adults, they're already probably pretty healthy. They're on that continuum where they haven't had preclinical markers of disease yet. But to be able to buffer and change young adults' mental and emotional well-being just through seven to eight servings is pretty profound. Why aren't we doing this in schools? Why aren't we doing this in hospitals where people are healing? This is a, another great article. Um, this was a, a very specific article on foods to help to reduce the incidence of depression. So they put together an algorithm of all of the different nutrients. This is Dr. Ramsey and Dr. Lachance. And this is what they came to in terms of the different antidepressant foods from greatest to least. And I, I listed them accordingly here. So what was up at the top? Vegetables. The biggest antidepressant category of food is what they came to. Like, Vegetables contain the spectrum of nutrients, things like zinc and um, vitamin D, a number of things that can help our mood. Second on the list was, this might be a surprise for some of you, organ meats. So up on that list, I remember that oysters were one of the highest. But now organ meats do not come in at the same level and the same height as vegetables. I mean, vegetables were far and away top of the list. There was also fruits as, as number three here. So I think that, uh, and, and here's what I did. I'm, I'm breaking them out for you in terms of the plant foods and the animal foods. And again, I'm not dietary dogmatic. I don't pitch to eating vegan or keto or paleo. You know, we, this is personalized nutrition. So however you choose to eat, I'm just presenting the data on here are the top plant foods. Watercress, who would have thought? 
that watercress has the most nutrient density to help reduce um, as a scoring system depression. Spinach, mustard. I just picked up some mustard greens from my local organic gardener yesterday because I know of their importance. In terms of animal foods, as I mentioned, oysters, liver and organ meats, maybe not for everybody. I, I don't love that one, but <laughs> for some people that is, uh, can be very healing. A lot of these, these organ meats, which are high in nutrients in the body, they're already concentrating them. I often think though too, that they can also be very toxic. So you have to be really conscientious if you're buying certain animal foods, right? So these are some of the, the animal foods. This is another large study showing mood changes lead to food intake. So it was a uh, looking at multiple studies. They found that a negative mood was associated with greater food intake. And this was emphasized in those that already had a bit of a disordered eating pattern. Whereas positive mood was also temporally associated with greater caloric intake. So Somebody in a positive mood might actually be taking in more calories just momentarily or temporarily. But when people are in a negative mood state, they, they tend to have greater occurrences of eating. So which come first? Is it the food that generates the mood or is it the mood that generates the food? This study, which was small, would suggest that it's the foods. They looked even acutely just within two days and they found that when these college students had a negative mood, they, um, this came after eating certain foods. So their assessment is that food intake precedes mood or overall behavior. I do think that it's hard to separate them. It's hard to separate this scientifically, but this is one study. Again, it's a small study. Let's talk briefly about stress as it relates to mood, right? Because stress is one of, it's like a triangle, emotions, mood, and we also have stress. All of these things are playing together. And I would put mood also, I would put mental health in that bucket as well, as well as our thoughts. So as uh, Dr. Hans Selye would say, it's not stress that kills us, it's our reaction to it, it's our perspective. And one of the things that has helped me to reduce stress or at least come into a different relationship with it was painting. You know, I had a lot of reproductive health issues. As I was going through that, even with nutrition, I found like I was at my ceiling in terms of everything I was doing. I was doing seminars to health professionals on women's health, and yet nutrition alone wasn't solely helping me. I was doing everything. I was doing massage. I was doing chiropractic, acupuncture. I was physically moving. The thing that really helped to resolve a lot of my stress was being creative. And maybe Robin will have me back to talk about creativity because I have a whole story around this that I won't get into, but I do think it's important to acknowledge the, the insertion of creativity into our everyday lives and what that actually means. It doesn't always mean painting on a canvas. And I think that we can bring that into our food and eating experience. I even have an online course just focused on looking at our seven creatives. You know, we're all creative in different ways. Some people are visual, some people are auditory, some people are connecting to food. So the three stages of stress, you know, that initial arousal, it's acute, the adrenaline is running in us. Then we have more of a chronic state where let's just say that we're stressed over a long period of time, like maybe some of us during the pandemic feel this, where it's like, there's no end in sight. When are, you know, and, and not having locus of control can really drive stress. And then eventually we get into this state of exhaustion and depletion, and then this is when diseases can start to crop up. So we need to take care of ourselves with stress. This is another one of my paintings where, you know, really keying into color, right? And, and how we have this endocrine system within us and it's constantly communicating. When our hypothalamus denotes stress, it sends a signal to our pituitary gland, which then sends a signal to our thyroid. Why do we have so many thyroid issues these days? Lots of different areas of exploration there, but one of them, I mean, a stressful life can lead to different issues at any level of our endocrine system, which is geared and controlled through our stress response. So I wanted to mention that because 
much of our stress, I want you to keep going back to that, that message from Dr. Selye that it's about our perception. So if we can change our perception, we can change the cascade that happens in the body. Common ways that people manage stress, some of them, I mean, you can add to this list yourself, but I do think that food becomes part of that mechanism. And this is where, again, we create this flow where we can't get out of it because now we're eating lots of sugar, lots of chocolate, lots of coffee to stay awake, lots of baking. We want to feel that sense of sweetness and we're trying to manage the stress, but we're displacing the stress onto the food. And this is having repercussions for the body, right? So we want to really like, how do we get out of that? And so for some of us, we might be more the type A um, type of person who has high stress and we react to stress and we might have greater food intake. And especially for women with disordered eating, um, some of us, there, there might be subclasses of people that just tend to naturally have higher cortisol after being exposed to a number of uh, different stressors. And so we might be more primed. And that's where maybe one of the categories during this pandemic is for people with disordered eating that certain things are turned on again. So taking extra care of ourselves with stress because we know that stress can get in the way of eating healthy and eating unhealthy creates more inflammation and stress. In fact, this is a very important, I want you to remember this, that um, when this study came out, it was just, just so um, incredible to have this connection between physiology and psychology. Inflammation predicted impulsivity. So what does that mean? That means that if we are eating an inflamed diet, brain on fire, mood on fire, that we're gonna to tend to be more reactive, more impulsive, and be aiming for gratification rather than to be thinking conscientiously with awareness and presence around our eating choices. So when we're eating inflammation, we're just propagating more of that type of behavior that leads to a more depressed mood. And we, we don't obviously want to subject ourselves to more criticism, shame, uh, feeling inadequate, you know, all the, this is why I like to move away the talk, from the talk on diets, because diets can be very, um, they, they create a lot of inhibition uh, and, and disinhibition, right? There's kind of the comparison, how well did I do on a diet? You feel like you're competing against yourself. There's this level of expectation. And I think we're learning much more about moving away from that. And in, in thinking about cravings, if we do have cravings, which can change based on our mood, to make sure that we have stabilized normal blood sugar, because one of the things even physiologically that can change our psychology is having low blood sugar. When we have low blood sugar, we're just gonna move for anything that will increase our sugar. And also to be thinking about, as it relates to blood sugar, be thinking about sleep, your sleep behaviors because what studies would show is that when we don't sleep as well, we're sleeping less hours, we tend to eat more sweets the next day. So it might actually be coming from uh, sleep that's not very fitful. I briefly wanna mention the GI tract. I know in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of flow through this just so you get a general sense. The gut is very responsive to stress, right? Why do we have kind of the butterflies in our stomach. And so as a result of the stress, we can get changes in the gut microbiome. And I'm sure that you've heard a lot about the role of the gut microbiome and mood. There is a gut brain connection. This is very well recognized in the science. And so what we are bringing into the gut is changing how we feel. Even the, the, the gut lining um, neurotransmitters, most of the, the neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine and um, so many of them are produced primarily in the gut. And then they travel system-wide throughout the body. So within that level of the gut, what can happen is we see a link to depression we see, because we see changes in neurotransmitters, stress impacts the gut, it changes the immune activity. 60 to 70% of your immune system is actually in the gut. So this can create a ripple effect, which is why many times you might have heard that all healing starts in the gut. There is some point of truth about that. I think healing can start on many levels, but thinking about what we eat 
And when we take in foods that are high in fiber, we get what is on this slide here is SCFA, short chain fatty acids. These fibers from whole plant-based foods are essentially changing our appetite, our satiety, our blood sugar, our immune system, and ultimately our neurological system. So there is an interconnection through the body. And if we do start with the gut, we are then going to, we're downstream, but then we're gonna have upstream effects to even the heart, the sympathetic response effect in the heart, as well as the brain. We know that emotions are reflected in the heart rate. And so um, what we want to do is when we are eating, come into the place of relaxation as much as we can for the sake of digestion. Emotional eating is, is another topic that I, I lecture widely on. And during this time, you know, just to look at how our mood is impacted. And if we are eating emotionally, many times this is very quick. We have cravings, we want a specific food like chocolate or bread or peanut butter. You know, there's something very specific that we crave in those moments. Whereas physical hunger is more slow and yielding, it's based in the body. Um, it has patience. It doesn't have the immediacy that inflammation creates in our body. So looking at why do we emotionally eat, right? Everything that I've been talking about and how important it is to express our emotions in healthy ways. So these are a number of different ways you can add to this list of how you repress emotions if you do. I think that there are all moments in which we don't feel comfortable to express how we really feel. But for me, I get it out in art or I go for a nice walk in the forest and move that through because otherwise, somebody like me might be more prone to eating down those emotions, trying to comfort myself. So lots of different symptoms of what repressed emotions can look like. And one of them is changes in mood. So having depression without an apparent cause, not talking about your feelings um, and, and feeling them, not just talking about them, but actually feeling them and letting them run their course and doing that in healthy ways in some creative format. But mostly, uh, we are not given messages about our emotions that would uh, enable us to really work with them in creative, helpful ways. Many times it's like, let's just get over it, right? It's a sign of weakness. But I do think that if we don't reconcile the emotional landscape, then we have more depressed mood, we have changes to our eating. It's, it's again, this whole systemic ripple effect. People who cry have better control of inflammation in their body. So just as I was mentioning about inflammation leading to reactivity, if we do allow ourselves to cry and express, we have better control of symptoms if we do have inflammation. And emotional eating wouldn't be an issue if we were eating spinach and broccoli and all of those, those antidepressant type of foods, right? But typically when we're eating emotionally, we're eating high calorie foods. Chocolate can be very satisfying, but when it's used as part of a comfort eating strategy, it tends to be associated with prolonging a negative mood. And as I mentioned before, you know, this whole context here, I'm just trying to give you a little bit of a bird's eye view into emotional eating and why it's so important to address emotions because it's connected to mood. And so if we are on a diet where we feel restrained and held back, only to go off the diet and to move like a tsunami into eating whatever we want. Um, again, it's, it's about context and about how we language communicate and perceive these things in our lives. And so restrained eating tendencies tend to be associated with greater anxiety. Now, this is something of interest. Um, emotions do impact taste. Isn't that interesting? So when we have positive emotions, what this study found is that positive emotions correlated with greater sweet taste and less sour, whereas negative emotions, uh, which were generated in the study through a hockey game, negative emotions were associated with greater sour and less sweet taste. So keep that in mind that um, your taste is constantly changing depending on your emotional state. Sad emotions um, can be reduced by fat, 
which is probably why, you know, we, we crave certain foods when we feel certain emotions to kind of blunt that feeling. So thinking about binging, uh, you know, with, with people with uh, disordered eating, if there is binging or splurging on certain foods, typically the mood that comes after that binge propels the next binge. And so much of my work with people on mood has been identifying how they feel and making sure that if there is a binge, not allowing to, to really have a lot of guilt around that, but to proactively create a strategy for going forward. And I think it's important to know what we feel. This is one of the clinical applications is to be able to actually say what you feel, not to have to belabor it, but really knowing what you feel. And then that is part of how we regulate our emotions. And when we feel a loss of control, oftentimes the emotional eating puts us back in control. And so there's kind of that dynamic. And so the more that we let our emotions out and confront them, then we feel more in that driver's seat. We feel more relational. We don't feel like we're hiding something. I also want to mention on the tales here of emotional eating that um, boredom can also fuel eating. Keep in mind that um, in this particular study with 240 women, it was found to be more prevalent than eating in response to anxiety or depression. So there is a case for looking at what we're doing in our lives and whether or not one is bored. All right, on the uh, heels here of trying to finalize in, in five to seven minutes, uh, I would like to introduce to you some clinical strategies. I wrote an article, published this in a scientific journal on the science of the rainbow of foods. Uh, this is actually my refrigerator on a Saturday where I decided for fun, I was going to categorize my foods and just put them in color coded. <laughs> I don't keep my refrigerator like, refrigerator like this all the time. This was a, a fun Saturday morning exercise, but it really speaks to how do we bring more color into our everyday eating? And so why do we need to do so? I have this handout and Robin can direct you to downloading this toolkit. You already have the food and mood tracker, um, looking at how do we track colors? Are we getting all of the colors every day? This is something that the whole family can do. And again, it gamifies, it gamifies eating healthy. I also have an eat the rainbow shopping list because most people, um, they, they need to see it. They need to recognize it like, oh, this is a food that goes into the green category. And so this is a nice sheet to put in your purse, your backpack, take with you even to the grocery store, keep it on the refrigerator to remind you to encourage more variety and get some ideas. So this is the Eat the Rainbow Toolkit with the one, two, three, the, the why, kind of the explanation, the actual food tracker. And this is already in motion in many different communities. I've um, put this word out even to congressional staff in July. This can be one small tool to help people to eat better and have fun in the process. You also have the, the food and mood weekly tracker, which um, what inspired me here was to have awareness. As I mentioned, it's important to understand our emotions, what we feel, and then to look at what we're eating. So this is a way to track colors of food with colors of mood. And so if you do end up using it, which I hope you do, let me know, give me your feedback. Uh, I'm, I'm curious what you find out about yourself, just even from a week, even if you just did this for three days, you might actually have some eye-opening type of revelations. There's also, you know, I love tools, so I'm just showcasing for you a number of different things that I use with my, my groups, my clients. On the right here is a variety tracker that I've created in order to encourage people getting out of food ruts, getting more variety. And it was based on something in the literature that I found on the left um, by um, Miguel Turibio Mateus, who published that, 50 foods in seven days for feeding the gut microbiome. That was really the essence and the reason for that activity. And, you know, um, I, I do want to bring into this discussion, it's not just the color eating the rainbow, it's not just the food and mood tracking, it's not just the variety, it's also the how. How are we eating? You know, there's this great quote, I saw them eating and I knew who they were, which is probably taking us back to what I was saying about having dinner with somebody. You can just tell so much about somebody 
based on what they choose to eat, how they eat, when they eat, why they eat. Eating is who we are. And most people, I would say, this is pre-pandemic at least, um, are, are very busy and they're eating while doing something else, especially while watching television. So what can we do to insert some more mindfulness, right? Because this can help with decreasing binge eating, decreasing emotional eating. And it can even help, this is a very small study with type two diabetic showing that bringing in mindfulness could even help with glycemic control. This is just bringing mindfulness to the meal. This is not even changing one's diet. Eating rate is correlated with body weight. And so slowing down at the meal and for parents, if you're a parent to think about what is the imprint that is being set at home in terms of the eating experience, because in this particular study, although you don't see the data, what they showed was that the children had similar eating rates to the parents. So um, we are consciously or subconsciously imparting much of our behavior to the next generation. Of course, home cooked meals would be, um, if we can, the, the, the best strategy to foster better eating patterns, have greater nutrient levels. And to think about our plates, our dishes, what are we drinking from? What are we eating from? 72% uh, of our calories come from food that we eat from the size of our plate. Have you ever been told, eat everything on your plate? I mean, I was. And, and so I kind of have this thing like, okay. So, but the plate is always changing its size, right? If we go out to eat. Um, and so really being conscientious about our intention, size of the plate, what we're eating, how we're cooking. And um, so sometimes what I like to do, this study is interesting because tea that was treated by monks, it was blessed by monks, led to better mood in people drinking the tea versus when they were drinking tea that had not been blessed. And by the way, they did not know that the, that the tea had been blessed. So uh, I think that that's pretty, pretty fantastic to think that we can change food and our experience of food through intention. I put on here a number of different science-based mind-body uh, interventions to, to think about, even breath work, meditation. I've written a book on guided imagery um, to really focus on visualizing what we want, creating our day, having a perception. This can help to, again, put us in that state of the locus of control and de-stress the mind relaxation response. It's not just giving us that sense of relaxation in the moment, but we actually change gene expression. And this is seen, especially in people doing this on a regular basis. It doesn't have to be for elongated periods of time, but on a regular basis, we actually metaphorically are bathing our genes in these relaxation signals. And that leads to better responses in inflammation, in insulin, and even aging. Now, if that's not <laughs> an attractive proposition, stress-induced eating may be helped by simply implementing the relaxation response. So if you feel like that's something that will portal you on into eating better, that's also um, a great strategy. Uh, I used to teach a college course on mindfulness and mind-body medicine. So that's what you're seeing here is a lot of my work in this area, looking at how meditation sessions are correlated with mood and how mindfulness practice leads to increases. It actually changes your brain matter, like the anatomical structure of the brain, not only your physiology and your psychology, but you can plump up in a good way certain parts of the brain um, with mindfulness practice. And then of course, you know, uh, something we've got to do in every moment, we're even doing it now, is to breathe and having those nice deep breaths to bring us back into balance. So I think you're getting the gist here. We can take a lifestyle approach of relaxation to reduce emotional eating. We can make better food choices to change emotional eating. You get to decide, but relaxation in and of itself is like medicine. Here we see how it's more important than even chewing your food well to enable you to digest complex carbohydrates. This is an old study, but I keep coming back to it because I just can't believe the impact that relaxation has. So whether it means being in nature, even looking at a picture of nature, just like I have here, can actually change your stress response. We know that being in nature has positive effects on mood. So if you're feeling the tendency to 
to emotionally eat, stress eat, eat inflammatory foods, go for a walk, get into nature. This will change your mood. There, there's science on this. And we just know this intuitively. Staying away from violent movies, watching our social media inputs, all of this, it's not just hearsay. There's actually science to suggest that we can upregulate cortisol, which is a stress hormone, just by watching something. The brain is, is, is not always discerning what's real and what's not. It takes a lot of energy for us to insert our perception on something that we're seeing. I mean, think of having a nightmare. You're, you know that it's not happening, but your body has a response. So be really conscientious um, about what you bring in. And in terms of emotional eating, my, my very basic three-step process is number one, become aware of how you feel. Number two, get some alternatives. And number three, longer term, work with a health coach or a nutritionist or somebody skilled in the art to get deeper into that subconscious space of why you're connecting into that particular food. And you can, as far as alternatives, 15 minute wait out, get away from that situation. Just like I mentioned, get into nature, get some variety, talk with a friend, make a healthier food choice. You know, there are so many different alternatives. Make a list of those for yourself. And I do think, I don't wanna uh, leave without stressing the importance of acknowledging emotions. They're not weakness. They're actually uh, what drive us. They're pretty potent. And so I would say to pay attention to them because they may be what are keeping you eating these inflammatory foods. So the, the less we acknowledge them, the more they're gonna keep getting our attention and they're gonna start doing it in ways that might be perceived in a more dysfunctional way in our lives. So I'm all about this. Maybe pick up uh, a new hobby, you know, something to allow yourself to express that, that sense of creative expression. Um, a laddering activity, sometimes I do for fun, uh, where people figure out what craving they have. We go into their craving. I ask them about their craving. Um, it, it's quite interesting what we hold in our subconscious mind about foods. And so, um, Again, there are a variety of techniques for this. I talk about this technique a little bit more in my book. I'm, I'm giving you a lot of different things here. To, it's almost like a buffet, right? I wanted you to have a buffet. I didn't wanna go deep and narrow into any one thing through this presentation. I wanted to give you a buffet of options because some of you might feel like certain things are more accessible than others. You know, Maybe you can't change the foods that you're eating, but you can change your relaxation response or you can change being in nature so I, I hope that um, you've had a lot of different things here to give you some insight as to how to modulate food and mood. So I wanna thank you. I know I went uh, a couple minutes over here, Robin. So oh, <laughs> apologies you know, for that. It's just like so tremendous. I, I love listening to you. I think I could listen to you all day. You have so yeah. much wisdom to share. And um, there, there was a lot, there, there was a buffet, you know, there was just a <laughs> lot to chew on there in terms of information. And what I love about what you've just provided us to is the scientific, you know, the research studies. It's, it's quite different, right? It's not just your opinion. It's, it's actually yeah. the research that shows certain things on impact on aging. And I, I just wanted to call out that specific um, statement about how well-being and happiness increase with consumption of fruit and vegetables equal to the psychological gain of moving from unemployment to employment. Wow. I Amazing. mean, I, I've never heard that before. And that was, that was something really interesting. And also how emotions can impact our um, taste and it, so that that was really particularly interesting to me as well so we are at time but i would just say for the folks that um, are viewing this presentation first of all i want to thank you for spending the time for putting together such a rich buffet <laughs> and i loved your um your uh paintings as well those were incredible so i do want to follow up with you on that offer to do something on creativity so we talk about that outside of this presentation but if anybody has questions i believe that your um, email and connection is available through the app so they might be able to ask questions that'll go to your your office as well um, 
thank you so, so much for spending the time with us. And um, uh, we'll look forward to hopefully talking with you again soon. Mm -hmm.